Welcome to the Neighborhood, a Mr. Rogers Tribute Podcast. This is a special bonus podcast this week. It's a little different than our normal show. David Dalt is not with us this week, but he was in spirit. He was so excited about this interview, and we had been talking about it for some time. Uh, And this episode is brought to you, uh, thankfully, by the good people at Sony Pictures who are bringing us the new movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And it was wonderful to be able to work with Sony Pictures and bring you this interview with Tom Juno. You're going to hear more about Tom in a moment. But the new movie is really based upon Tom's uh, story, uh, Can You Say Hero, that appeared in Esquire back in 1998. And the movie really is about the relationship. It captures kind of the heart of the relationship that Fred Rogers and Tom had and I'm just so pleased that we are able to bring you this episode. Tom was wonderful, just a really great guy and I hope we're going to get to bring him on the show again to talk even more and just share about some of the other great things in his life that he has going on but he couldn't have been nicer. Uh, His answers are really interesting, and it's great to find out more about Fred Rogers throughout this episode. Uh, I even learned a couple of things I didn't know, and and I've read a lot about the man and researched a lot, and you know if you follow me on the at Mr. Rogers Say Twitter account, uh, we just have a lot of information about Fred Rogers there, but it was so great to get to hear from one of his dear friends. And... um, As always, uh, I I am so pleased to be your host this week, and as we walk into this podcast neighborhood, I want you to know that no matter where you are from, you're welcome here, and I am glad to be your neighbor. Every daughter, every son, every tribe, and every tongue, in the spirit of Fred Rogers and the life of welcome that he lived, welcome to the neighborhood. It's so good to have Tom Juno with us this week. My guest today in the neighborhood is award-winning journalist and senior writer at ESPN, Tom Juno. Tom has written a number of memorable pieces over the years, including The Falling Man and The Terrible Boy, but he is perhaps best known for a profile article he wrote on Fred Rogers for Esquire in 1998 titled, Can You Say Hero? That Esquire article serves as the framework of the highly anticipated new movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, in which Tom Hanks portrays Fred Rogers and Matthew Reese portrays Lloyd Vogel, a character loosely based on Tom. The movie opens in theaters everywhere this November. Tom Juno, welcome to the neighborhood. Well, thanks for having me. Well, I am so glad that you could be here today. I, I was trying to think back, and I had been familiar with your writing for some time, but I think the first time I ever remember putting a face to you was in the documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And uh, it was such a great film, and it was so good to get to hear what you had to say there. I'm just curious as we start today, what was it that impressed you the most about the way that Morgan Neville told the story of Fred Rogers in that film? Um, he just, I mean, he just made one right choice after another. I mean, even even the way he didn't really spend a lot of time or energy identifying the various voices in the uh, in the film. I mean, I, I think I was just Tom Juno, friend, journalist. Um, I think that Bill Eisler uh, was friend, colleague. I mean, it was it was just very it was very um, minimalistic in that way. And I think it was minimalistic in order to uh, present a a maximalist um, version of Fred. Um, I mean, I think that Fred rightfully, you know, dominates that film from the moment you see him. I remember, I remember seeing, going to see that movie and seeing Fred in the, in the very beginning when he's in black and white and talking about modulations on the keyboard. And, you know, I mean, I hadn't seen Fred in a long time at that point. He'd been, he'd been gone a long time. And as soon as I saw him, as soon as I saw his eyes, I said, Oh, that's right. I remember now Fred was a genius. And, you know, that, that feeling and that impression just never dims at any time of watching that movie. Wow. 
and it is really a great film. It was just, uh, you know, and the, the time that it hit, I just think the, the world needed some of that kind of kindness again, you know, and it was just at a perfect time. Um, and well, and, and one thing that I really like about the film, and it almost reminds me a bit of your article that you wrote about Fred, the film almost makes Fred the narrator as as you're watching mm, yeah, it too. Yeah, it's it it's it's, it's yeah, very yeah. clever in how that's done. And I I felt like you did a bit of that years ago when you wrote um, your famous article. Now and uh, I'm curious about the piece that you wrote and what was the situation in your own life that led to this initial interview with Fred that led to a friendship. Well, I mean, I think that you know basically I had you know when I was at I was at uh, GQ and I was in my mid thirties, pretty, you know, pretty late um, in my career um, as a journalist when I came to GQ and started writing pieces that were, you know, very, very successful. I, you know, I won two national magazine awards in a row and I had sort of come out of nowhere um, to achieve, you know, acclaim and success. And so I, when my editor moved over to um, Esquire, I followed him there with great fanfare. And that's hard to believe now that, you know, where we're magazines are, are, you know, barely, you know, holding on to their toehold of existence. But at the time there was, you know, a, a, the movements of magazine writers could, could, um, be recorded with great fanfare. So I went to um, Esquire and basically, you know, I kind of flopped uh, is really is really, really what happened. I, I wrote a um, uh, an article. Um, my first article when I got there was on Kevin Spacey. It was controversial in all the wrong ways. And I just I did not know what to do either with my sudden a claim or the sudden criticism that had come up around me. And um, when I met Fred, um, I didn't expect any of that, but I didn't expect what happened. And what happened was that he recognized that. He recognized um, that I was uh, a hurting soul who needed something and decided to uh, methodically go around and give it to me. And that's really what the story was, was all about. He saw, he saw more in me than I saw in him at the beginning. Wow. And, you know, I had, I had read somewhere that because of the Kevin Spacey article that it, it seems like maybe he had kind of blackballed you among um, sort of other celebrities that would be looking for interviews. Is that, is that the case? Well, yeah, he had he um, he actually um, he and his um, his agency um, and perhaps his studio. And I, I, I it's you know it's a long time ago now, so I can't remember that. But I I mean he definitely called for um, a boycott of uh, me and of Esquire as far as doing other celebrity stories. So yeah, uh, that's true. So that must have been, as you say, it must have been a great burden upon your shoulders at that time. And uh, that's it's really powerful that I think Fred was able to detect that uh, about you. I, I'd love to hear more just about that experience of, of you uh, going to meet him for the first time. And it, it's a really great story, but I wonder if many of our listeners have ever had a chance to hear it before. Yeah, um, I mean, it was, you know, the story was assigned to me. I did not think of the story. I did not ask for the story. It was assigned to me. And, you know, I was interested from the story. I didn't, I didn't resist it, but it was definitely not my idea because I didn't, I didn't grow up with Fred. I was a little bit too old for Fred. And to me, Fred was the guy um, parodied by Eddie Murphy on, on Saturday Night Live. That's kind of who he was to me. Um, and so, you know, I got his number from Family Communications and I called him in New York City uh, where he had an apartment. And, you know, he picked up the phone and it was, you know, his, I might not have known Fred that well, but 
I did know his voice, you know, and because it was his voice was unmistakable. And he he picked up and I I told him, you know, who I was. And he was he knew that there was going to be a call coming. So he wasn't he wasn't surprised. But, you know, I, I he asked where I was. And I said, well, I'm on, you know, in Esquire's offices on 55th Street. And he was like, oh, my, um, I'm on I'm on I'm on 56th. I'm a right around the corner. Would you like would you like to come over? I mean, this is. I mean, right off the bat. And and I said, sure. And he goes, well, I have to warn you that I've been I've been taking a nap. And so I'm I'm in my robe and slippers, if you don't mind. And, you know, I was like, OK, you know, so I was I was I was game. And uh, and I walked over there and it really was just around the corner. And I walked in there and then, you know, Fred answered the door as advertised in, in his blue bathrobe and his slippers. And, you know, I, I, it was, the apartment was kind of dim. The, 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 the blinds were, were drawn and, um, I went in there and, and then immediately he, he basically, we, we talked for a few minutes and, and then immediately he started you know, doing the thing which he did, which was turning around all the questions that I had for him. And we had the whole, you know, old rabbit conversation. You know, I, he had, he asked me if, you know, I think I, I think I asked him about his childhood. And of course, so he asked me about my childhood and he asked me if there was anything from my childhood that I really, really loved and, and cherished. And when you think about that, you know, as a way of, of relating to people, you know, a, a stranger walks in to your home and this stranger is going to do a story on you and you want to somehow connect with that stranger. I mean, asking that stranger to name the thing that he loved as a child is a really, really powerful thing. And I don't think it was you know, like a power move. I don't think it was pure deflection. I think it was, it was connection, but it was just connection, not on the level that I was expecting, you know? So we had that conversation, you know, and I said, well, I had this, I had a, I, I had a, a rabbit that I called, you know, old rabbit. And he was like, well, Tom, I, and I'll bet you knew him when he was a very young rabbit. <laughs> you know? And, so we had this, you know, we had this conversation and, and, you know, I mean, I get, I get emotional just, just thinking about it because he was just, he was so good at, at finding that in people. And I don't mean in just me, I mean, in people, I mean, of peeling back your layers of defenses and finding this true sort of soul that sat at the bottom of it. And that was in some ways still a child. So, you know, so I answered, we had that conversation and then I'm sitting there and <laughs> he, you know, he, the phone rings and it's his wife, you know, Joanne, and he puts me on, you know, I mean, I've, I've met him for, I don't know, all of 15 minutes, a half hour. And so I'm talking to Joanne and then all of a sudden, you know, I get blinded by this light and it's, and he's, you know, he shot a flashbulb picture of me. He was like, oh, I always like to send pictures of my new friends to Joanne, you know. And, and so I was just, you know, I was completely, completely disoriented from the start. I mean, I knew I, I had the instincts to know that that he was, you know, that he was special. I didn't I didn't know at the time that the story could be made special, but I did know pretty much from the start um, that he was special because, you know, this, this wasn't my first rodeo. I've met a lot of people. I've, you know, I'd done, you know, a fair amount of, of, you know, a fair number of profiles and, and, you know, Fred came from to say that he came from left field is to understate it. So he really had that ability to, to keep, you off guard in the best way. And I think that off guard is the key phrase there. Um, you know, you, you know, we're people who have our guards up 
he managed to um, get me and a lot of other people he met off guard. And, and you know, I've, I've read that many journalists, including yourself, have, have said that he wasn't the easiest person to interview just because he was so interested in the person he was speaking with. So, as you said, uh, while you're trying to ask him questions, he'd, he'd turn it around and start asking you questions. I don't, I don't know if he answered a single question of mine. And I, I, I saw him... I saw him, you know, many, many times. I mean, I'm not, I'm not including, um, I mean, I saw him three times as a journalist. I mean, I saw him in New York and then I went down to see him in Pittsburgh and then I went and saw him in Pittsburgh again on a, on a trip where I accompanied him to La Trobe. But, you know, I saw him again um, shortly after that, uh, after, after the story came out. So I'm in Pittsburgh and, you know, I've ta I talked to him, you know, until his death. And, you know, we 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 corresponded. He answered questions. I mean, to say that he didn't answer questions is is not getting it quite accurately. He answered a lot of questions. If you wanted to ask him about prayer and the nature of God and the promise of of the scriptures, he would talk all day about that, but ask him about, you know, growing up, ask him about him. Um, he, he was just, um, uh, a very skillful, uh, fencer. You know, when you watch two people with masks on and wearing, you know, white protective gear fence, you, admire their skill at never being touched and, and Fred was definitely that person. Wow. Well that's great to hear. I, I love I just love hearing stories about Fred and I'm, I'm glad to hear these. Um have you had a chance to see the new film yet that's coming out in Yeah, I saw it I saw it in July. I saw it during the summer. Oh great. And uh it was it everything we're hearing about it? Yeah, I think it's a beautiful movie. I really do. And, um, I, you know, I, I have to say, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect when I, when I walked in there. Um, you know, I mean, I think that there was a part of me that was trying to keep my distance from it in a lot of ways. I mean, even the, I mean, the character is, is not named Tom Juneau. He's named, he's named Lloyd Vogel. And I was, I was pretty happy to let it stay that way. And then I see the movie and, um, you know, the truth of, my relationship with Fred is, is all over that movie. And it, it moved me, um, tremendously. I mean, I was, um, not expecting to cry in that movie, but I, I certainly did. Well, that's certainly good to hear. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Um, and, and I was going to ask you, and you've really already answered it. I was going to ask how, kind of how loosely the character of Lloyd Vogel was based on you, but it, it sounds like he's different, but, but he gets, the heart of the relationship, and I'm glad to hear that. I think that's a special thing that they were able to to pull off. Hopefully, well, I think that I think that you just said it, um, you know, accurately. Um, it's different. Um, Lloyd's different. I mean, he's much more resistant to Fred than than I was. Um, but they got at the, you know, the real truth of it, which is that. You know, Fred had the ability to see something in people, and he and he saw something in me, and that was that was the thing that really really hit me um, seeing the movie, um, and it hits me all the time. It hits me on really I think these days, especially now that we're talking about Fred so much, it hits me on a daily basis, which is how lucky I was. Well, in, in the profile that you wrote about Fred. Uh, there, there really are a lot of remarkable moments that you bring up, and, and yet there's one that I'm interested in uh, that I think made it into the new film. I can only say that just based on tra mm. trailers I've seen, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. And it seems there's a, a point where Fred is serenaded on a subway mm -hmm. uh, by some people, and I'd, I'd just love to hear that from you, sort of your account of, of how that happened. Again, I know we read it in the article, but it's, it's a great story. Well, you know, he 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 was a man who traveled on the subway. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's, I think, really the where that story begins. You know, I mean, he he's not a person who traveled around um, New York 
you know, in a in a cocoon of of privacy. He was um, he was kind of a public person and uh, that way and he was open to everybody and he was on the subway and kids recognized him and they began you know singing the familiar song because he was he was so familiar to people you know i mean he was he was their neighbor you know and and so i think it you know i think it sounds you know extraordinary but it makes it really makes you know perfect sense i mean you know when i was with him at penn station i mean i mean people would just walk by and like hey mr rogers <laughs> <laughs> you know and there's even a, a thing in the story where it's hey mr effing rogers you know and and um you know so he was he had that he had that ability i mean i mean in in some ways it it felt like you were with a um a friendly space alien you know <laughs> but in a, in another way it was it was like you were with somebody you'd known all your life that there's also one little detail that didn't make it into your story that i heard about later on um that happened uh, after your first meeting with fred and you you left a pen apparently yeah, at, yeah. at his apartment. Yeah, and yeah. I, I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about what what is now really an artifact of that time together. Well, it's um, th that day uh, when I visited Fred and talked about Old Rabbit and um, you know had the photo taken of me um, and I talked to Joanne and all of that uh, in in the in that swirl of sort of uh, pleasant confusion of that day, uh, I left my pen behind. And, um, when I went the next day to see Fred, cause we were going to go to Penn station and I was going to accompany him. Um, I got there and on the kitchen table is a, um, like a beige envelope and on it, it says, this is Tom's pen. And it says it in, you know, in Fred's amazing handwriting, Fred, everything that Fred wrote, he wrote, I don't know if this is going to be the right word, but he wrote calligraphically. He wrote it, he wrote it like callig calligraphy. I don't think that he was capable of just writing scrawl. Um, and I think that that, you know, just, just, just shows who he was. I mean, he, I literally, I mean, he literally, you know, transformed sort of everything that he did, even just writing a note on an envelope. And so it says, this is Tom's pen in this, you know, beautiful handwriting. And that is in my office right now. And I've never opened it and I've never, you know, I've never used that pen. I've always I've always thought that I would, if I was going to do that, if I was going to open that, I would, I would use it for, um, like a special occasion. Like uh, I, I'm, I'm writing um, a book right now. I'm writing what, what's my first book, and I've always thought that, you know, like, like when I write the end, <laughs> you know, on the manuscript, I'd use that pen. Hmm. Wow. That's that's a terrific story. I think that would be one of my most prized possessions. I I and I just love if I can, I'm going to try to get a a, a snapshot of that uh, from the website where I saw it to put on our web page, just so the listeners can see. Um, it's you're right. His writing is impeccable, <laughs> and uh, it's that's a great story and and what a great uh, memory to have of him and to be able to keep that with you. Since we're talking about writing, I, I wonder did. Did you learn anything about being a writer just from your relationship with Fred? Yeah, I, I did. I did. I learned that um, goodness is as mysterious um, and as worthy of a deep dive as evil. I mean, I've always been interested in evil and how and how bad things happen I've, it's you know it's something i've written about you know over and over again you know i've i've never been afraid to 
um, go dark as a, a journalist. But Fred taught me that invaluable lesson, which is that is that goodness um, deserves the same scrutiny as badness. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned that because, you know, it was very recently that um, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood premiered, I believe, at the Toronto Film Festival. Yeah. And uh, that movie and one other movie, which I believe just came out today, Joker, um, both met an incredible amount of acclaim, and there's been all kinds of talk about Academy Awards for each of those mm -hmm. films. And I was just thinking about it today that that really says something interesting maybe about our humanity, that here we have two of the most acclaimed films seem, seemingly of the year, um, right now anyway, that people are talking about. And one is about one of the most evil villains that anyone's ever conceived of, and the other one is about one of the kindest people who probably ever lived on this planet. And um, I, I'm just curious as to, because you have taken so many deep dives and, and you haven't been um, afraid to dive into that part, why do you think that is? Why do you think that is that, that we are people that, that seem to go to such extremes and, and seem to find, even in our entertainment, that we're so drawn to things like that? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that the spectrum of, of human experience is so, so broad. I mean, you know, I mean, just look at, look at the existence of, of war, right? Um, you know, um, you know, I mean, uh, multiple atrocities um, occur in any given day of even wars that you've never heard of, things that would chill your soul and, and you know, um, you know, make your blood run cold. And yet during, in, in war, there are, acts of unforgettable um, heroism, unforgettable courage, unforgettable um, love and, and charity, people sacrificing themselves for the greater good, for their fellow man, for their, you know, the person next to them in the trenches. And I mean, so, I mean, so, I mean, nothing, portrays um, or captures the kind of the duality of, you know, human nature, you know, better than that. And I think that, that, you know, the duality of human nature is, is written on just about everything that we do, you know, uh, including journalism for that matter. And, um, you know, so it, it's, it makes sense that it, it shows up in our entertainment. Yeah, certainly. Well, and I was thinking of it today just as I was kind of reflecting on that a little bit. And, and also knowing that, that really, if you go through some of the old shows of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, he really didn't shy away from evil and the very hard things. I mean, some of his shows did no. directly um, go right at war and, they, they, you know, racism and things like that that yeah. we don't often associate with Fred Rogers. But he was very bold in those things, and it made me think of one of my very favorite quotes, and uh, it was used a lot back when um, Won't You Be My Neighbor came out, but one of my very favorite Fred Rogers quotes is, uh, love is at the root of everything, all learning, all parenting, all relationships, love or the lack of it. And uh, I, I really think that speaks volumes um, in all of these situations. And I, I just found it so interesting that seemingly this new movie about Joker, I think the approach they're going at is he's sort of a result of a lack of love. And, and right. Fred Rogers is sort of the result of someone who was loved and learned to love very well. And I, I just find those two dualities fascinating. I appreciate you taking a moment to talk about that. Well, you know, Fred, Fred genuinely believed that love was not just at the center of what we do. I, I, he genuinely believed that love was at the center of the universe, that it was you know, the primary um, building block, that it was the force that trumped all others. And, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, for like, for me, the jury is still out on that. 
but for him it wasn't i mean he that that was that was his faith and that was his faith i i think that his faith in that fact was or in in that idea was was stronger than his faith in just about anything else um including you know the the including religious dogma he was not a dogmatic person but he had a, this unshakable belief you know in love and um you know it was it was one of those things that was that was it was humbling about him and i i guess the other thing that you know and i i say it all the time and and you know anybody who's going to talk to me is probably going to hear this but i mean the the thing that's you know to me um you know so interesting about fred is is you know he you know obviously was a soft spoken man and he obviously was a very nice man and he was obviously a very kind man but he was his his strength and his you know conviction and his will um all of those things are very underrated in him you know you you mentioned uh religion a moment ago and i think most people know or or if they don't they're going to find out now that fred was was an ordained minister um, and that his television show was actually commissioned uh, from his church, and he was considered an evangelist, <laughs> which is, right. is fascinating right. to me. In some ways, he was like the first televangelist that we had. Yeah, he was. Uh, That's really great. That, I, I love that. I love what you just said, that phrase. That's great. And, and you know, it really – and he's he's the best one we've ever had or ever will have, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, he, he really did minister with his life. Uh, everything I've read about him, every, every time I watch him – there really is some sort of something transcendent about him, uh, and and you're right. I can sense the love shining through, and he ministered to so many people so well. And it's been fascinating to me as I've run this Twitter account that I just put up Mr. Rogers quotes every day, and we we tend to gain about a thousand followers every couple of weeks. It's amazing, kind of just just these quotes that people have, and I will get messages from people and. They'll tell me how much that it means to them and how much they needed it. I've even had people at times say they were considering taking their life, and that quote hit them at just the right time, and they really needed to know that they were cared about. Um, and my question for you as we start to close out our conversation today, um, in what ways do you think Fred Rogers was a minister to you specifically as his friend? Well... So, I mean, a couple of things just to go, you know, you had said before that that Fred was, you know, the most successful, of, you know, the first and most successful televangelist. And I think that he was the first and most successful televangelist because he he never spoke of God on, on the air, but he he lived God. And so I, I think that that's always, you know, what fascinated me about Fred was that he was obviously a, a godly man, but he he exuded, you know, God, he exuded, you know, godly, godly principles. So he, you know, I mean, I think that Fred, you know, did have a, like, if you look at his, if you look at his um, email correspondence with me, it was much more um, theologically oriented than, anything that he said to me in person and certainly anything that he said on his television show. But, um, so, I mean, he did, he definitely had a, you know, a religious purpose. And I think that he really, like he, you know, genuine, I mean, he led me when I met him and did the story about him. He led me ultimately to a moment of prayer that is, um, that forms the, you know, the climax of, of the story, the end of the story. But that's not the most important thing that he did. The most important thing was not getting me to pray. The most important thing that Fred did was to trust me um, when I really, really needed that. I really needed trust. And Fred offered that to me without me having to say so. Uh, he just He just knew it. He knew it in his heart of hearts. He knew it by looking at me, I guess, or, or experiencing, you know, um, time with me. And, um, 
and he gave that to me and it and it was it was the great gift well thank you for sharing that and uh we you know i'm so glad that he invested in you in that way you you have really done uh, some amazing writing over the years and, and you continue to do so and i i was just rereading again uh today the terrible boy and and you know what a what a haunting you know article that is i mean it made me uh, almost go to tears a few times but um, you have such a gifting uh, for writing and I'm just so glad again for the way that um, that you were able to meet uh, Mr. Rogers and the way that he invested in you and, and I'm sure it was mutual I'm sure that you added a lot to his life as well and uh, it's been wonderful getting to speak to you um, you know, if if Fred was here today, you would know this much better than I do because I never met him. I only know him by reputation, uh, but I'm sure he would let you know how proud that he is of you. And I think that uh, myself and all of us who are listening, uh, we're proud of you as well. Well, you know, there's another journalist, Tim Madigan, who had, you know, an experience sim similar to mine with Fred. And the name of his book is I'm Proud of You. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've I've had to, uh, uh, Tim on uh, my other podcast before. I really enjoyed that book as well, and 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 you're right. That and that's another wonderful book. Um, but but we are proud of you, and uh, and I I just want to thank you for taking time to to stop by for a visit here in the neighborhood. Uh, we are really looking forward to the new movie, and I hope we get a chance to do this again sometime. I hope so too, and I hope you enjoy the movie. Thank you for joining us here this week in the neighborhood. Music featured on the podcast was Nouvelle Noel by Kevin McLeod and all other music by Benjamin Tossett at bensound.com. Special thanks to my guest, Tom Juneau, and thanks to Sony Pictures for helping us set up this interview with Tom. And thank you to the at Mr. Rogers Say community on Twitter. This podcast wouldn't be around without you, and I'm so grateful for the community that we have there together, spreading kindness. I'm your host, Rick Lee James. My personal Twitter account is at Rick Lee James. My website is rickleejames.com. My other podcast is Voices in My Head, the Rick Lee James podcast. And I look forward to being with you again next time. Until we meet again, remember, you make every day special. You know how? By just your being you. There's only one person in this whole world like you, and people can like you exactly as you are.